So we're going to take a look in this video at interpreting pH curves. So you've done titrations in the past and in a titration you have a titrant in the burette. You have the sample in the Erlenmeyer flask and when you've got the table the chemical that you have the volumes that you get in the delta V so D V initial minus V final is the delta V that is the titrant and so the titrant is the chemical you're adding to the sample and in the titration you add the chemical until there's a change in color the change in color for redox titrations was because of a change in the entity so that you would get something that's got a new color. So like in our example, redox titration example that we did, we had purple permanganate that reacts and becomes col clear colorless. And then when a drop of the purple color persists, you reach your end point. And so you end the titration and you calculate using your average volume. In acid-base titrations, there is an indicator. And the indicator, indicator, um, changes color at the end point or the equivalence point and we stop the titration but if you did the titration and you added the the uh, volume of titrant was plotted on the x-axis and the pH was plotted on the y-axis if we were adding chemical to it we would stop our titration at maybe here but if we kept adding the chemical the curve would look something like that and so if we could measure that pH directly and add the volume of the titrant, we end up getting this curve and what's happening is the reaction is changing the chemical in here. Up at this point, you get a sudden change in the pH because you've used up one of the chemicals. So in this case, they'd be adding a base. So in this diagram I've got here, you'd be adding a base because you can see the pH is going up to a sample that is an acid and here it's mostly acid particles but when you get to this point the acid amount equals the base and this is called an equivalence point now in a titration where we were going to be measuring and the color of the indicator changed and we stopped it we would stop there and the volume would be the end point because we literally ended the titration. But if we've got the graph, we go past the end point and this is called an equivalence point. So we're gonna see a few different graphs and if the graph is going up like this, the titrant is base. If the graph is going down like this, the titrant is acid because the pH is on this curve, the halfway point on the sudden, sudden steep section is called the equivalence point. And if we were doing the titration, they would instead just stop the titration at that point because you get a color change in the, in the indicator. Okay, so pH curves measure the pH of a titration. They go past the end point, the point at which the titration would end. And the color of the indicator has just changed. The equivalence point can be read from the pH curve. So we're going to be able to read that off of the curve. It is halfway along the sudden change in pH. So here, where we had this sudden change in pH, halfway up that is the equivalence point, where you've got the same amount of acid and base. Now, this is a really, really important term. Buffers are chemicals that resist, to chain, resist change to pH as an acid or basis added to them. And so that's kind of like an empirical definition. We can see that the pH isn't changing much. And in this graph that we've got here, the buffer region is going to be here. 
I'll help you be able to identify in this video where buffering happens in these curves. But in that section, you can see that the pH isn't changing much as they add quite a bit of titrant. As they go this way, the pH is pretty consistent. Then we get a sudden change in pH here, and then it's slow change here. The only titration, the only area where there is a buffer though is here. And so being able to identify buffering regions in these graphs is one of the tasks we need to do. Now buffers are made out of a mixture of a weak acid and its conjugate weak base. So both of those things need to be in the solution and we want to have about the same amount. So if I had like 0 0.50 mole per liter hydrofluoric acid, because that's a weak acid, if I wanted to make that solution into a buffer, I would add the same amount of 0 0.50 mole per liter sodium fluoride, because what I'd be adding is fluoride ions. This is the conjugate base to this weak conjugate acid. And so when I'm looking at my table here for acids and bases, the combination for a buffer should have an entity here and an entity here. And I could make it by adding the same concentration, say 1.0 mole per liter at the same volume. So we'll say 100 milliliters of that. And then if I added 100 milliliters at 1.0 mole per liter of NaHCO3, that is this chemical. So I would have the weak acid and its weak conjugate base. That is a buffering solution. And I'll explain why the buffer works to resist pH in a second. But things that would never actually be a buffer are anything that has your strong acid. So if I had, say, sulfuric acid and sodium hydrogen sulfate or potassium hydrogen sulfate, that's not a buffer because by definition, if it's got a strong acid in it, we can't call it a buffer. It has to be a weak acid and it's conjugate weak base and we want the same amount of those two things. So that's a common question. It, if it says, is this a buffer solution and it contains any of these strong acids, it is not. If it is asking if it's a strong, if it's a buffer and it has hydroxide ions as an entity, say you've got sodium hydroxide in there that we're adding as one of the components to make a buffer, it's not a buffer solution. It has to be a weak acid and it's conjugate weak base. Okay, so now, when we are, um, the, the key component to buffers are that they resist pH change. And so I'm going to try to explain why that would happen. So if I had hydrogen fluoride and I had fluoride ions and I had water and I had, let's say, sodium ions because it was sodium fluoride, right? So that's a mixture of hydrofluoric acid, a weak acid, and sodium hydrogen fluoride, a weak base, then this would form a buffer solution. And the reason it's a buffer solution is that because both of these entities are present, if I had hydro that solution and I added hydroxides to it, the hydroxide will react with the hydrofluoric acid to make fluoride and water. And so the pH won't change much because we already have fluorides. So we're just making a few more fluorides and making a little bit less of the acid. The pH will change, but very subtly, right? Because we're just basically removing a few of the weak acid particles. Similarly, if we had um, fluorides in the, we, we've got fluorides in our buffer and instead we added acid to it, the fluoride ions and the acid, I probably should make these double-headed arrows, sorry, would make 
hydrogen fluoride, hydrofluoric acid, and water. And so by adding strong acid to that buffer solution, it'll react with the weak conjugate base to make just more of the chemical we already have in our buffer solution, because our buffer solution had that and that. By making more of the fluorides or more of the hydrogen fluoride, the pH doesn't change much.